name is Derek Fremd. I've been in the video, film, and media production business for over 30 years. I started out in 16mm documentary film and worked through the days of tube video cameras and tape-based linear editing. For the past dozen years, I've had my own company producing HD video for a variety of clients. Along the way, I've won a few awards and learned a lifetime of knowledge on how to professionally shoot video, record audio, and create professional media. Now, I'm not telling you this to toot my own horn, but rather to let you know that I've made a pretty good living in video production for a long time using certain techniques, because while technology is always changing, the basics of visual storytelling are timeless. What are those basics? Proper camera operation, proper lighting, and clean audio recording. First off, let me tell you what this series is and what it isn't. This series is not for the intermediate or advanced operator who is already in the marketplace earning a living. This series is for those of you who, like me, as a kid may have bolted a camera to a sled or a bicycle, or later on made films with friends and thought, wow, this would be pretty cool to do for a living. Now you may have shot some footage with an iPhone or a GoPro, but that is not enough to do this professionally. This series is like a boot camp, taking a raw recruit with no experience in the beginning and at the end turning that recruit into a professional, ready to take on the world. If you follow all of my videos in this series, you will have the knowledge to become a freelance camera operator or work for a television news station or work for a production company. Now you could spend many thousands of dollars to attend a school to learn all this or instead buy this series and spend your savings on buying equipment to start your own business. The first video is about what types of equipment you should buy. The next segment is on how to shoot professional video. This is followed by segments on lighting, recording professional audio, tips, and best practices. Sadly, the longer I'm in this business, the more I see and hear poorly shot video with horrible camera work bad lighting, and terrible audio. You can dress it all up with fast cuts, effects, and loud music, but it's still amateurish and will not get you your next job. The keys to professional video combine equipment selection with technique. In this first video, I will be discussing what features you need to look for in your equipment. I will not be endorsing any particular model or brand. For one, the technical aspects of this business change on a continual basis. Number two, there are multiple options available from all the major manufacturers that are suitable. And number three, nobody's endorsing me. While there are a multitude of camera types, I will show you the features of cameras you will most likely encounter as a freelancer using a production company's equipment or in a news environment. Codex and bitrate. First, let's talk about the features to look for in a suitable camera for professional video. Before we do that, we need to discuss a little bit of tech stuff first. So bear with me. With the advent of digital video, there has been an ever-evolving creation of codecs. What is a codec? Codec stands for compression decompression. The amount of digital information on a single frame of HD video is huge. If one were to record video totally uncompressed, the resulting file size would be gigantic and for most purposes unwieldy. In order to make the file size manageable, manufacturers and engineers have come up with many different ways to compress the video to make it smaller. The way they do this is by analyzing each frame pixel by pixel. And if one's frame's pixels are the same as the previous frame, it just duplicates the pixels. The only part of the video that the codec changes is when the pixels change. So, for example, a camera locked down on a scenic beauty shot will be a much smaller file size than a scene where there is a lot of action and camera movement. Related to codecs is bitrate. A more highly compressed codec will have a smaller bitrate to create a smaller file size. A less highly compressed codec will have a larger bitrate. For example, HDV has a bit rate of 25 megabits per second, while XD cam has a bit rate of 35 megabits per second. Here's an example. I shot this scene three times. The first is uncompressed HD. 
Next up is ProRes HQ. Finally, I recorded it in HDV. You can see on the screen that one minute of video for each codec has a different megabit per second bit rate and a different file size. Why is all this important? Why not just shoot at the most compressed codec possible to get the smallest file sizes? Because picture information is lost the more you compress it and can result in ugly artifacting. Artifacts are things like smearing and blockiness around edges. It's like putting a pound of potato chips in an 8 ounce bag. You may be able to do it, but you'll end up with a lot of broken chips. Also, the more digital information you have, the more you can manipulate it. For example, while it is possible to create an acceptable green screen composite from HDV, it is easier to make a cleaner green screen composite from a less compressed, higher bitrate video signal. Cameras. Now that we have that out of the way, let's talk cameras. Number one, you need to be able to record 1920 by 1080 HD video. In order to efficiently record HD video, some codecs are designed to perform some pretty serious mathematical gymnastics to get to 1920 by 1080 pixels. This is achieved by recording in non-square pixels. HDTV consists of 1920 square pixels horizontally by 1080 square pixels vertically. What if we could make the pixels non-square, that is rectangular? This is exactly what various manufacturers have done. For example, DVC Pro HD uses a 1280 by 1080 pixel scheme. Because the pixels are rectangular, less pixels can fill a 1920 by 1080 pixel space. Other examples include the HDV codec at 1440 by 1080 pixels and Sony's XDCAM SP codec also at 1440 by 1080 pixels. You should be able to record to either videotape or some sort of memory card. Compact Flash, SXS, P2, etc. If you want to shoot for broadcast, you will need a camera that will record a bit rate of at least 35 megabits per second. If your intended clients are for DVD or web, you can select a camera with a lower bit rate, such as HDV or AVC HD. I'll explain later and in subsequent videos but you want your camera to have the option of manual control over all of its functions focus, iris, zoom, white balance, frame rate, audio. The main technical thing you need your camera to do is create the proper exposure for whatever scene you're shooting. Correct exposure has different variables which we'll get into more detail shortly. These variables include f-stop, which is related to iris, and shutter speed or how many times the shutter opens and closes in a second. Zebra. The first thing you want for proper exposure is zebra. Zebra will superimpose diagonal lines in your viewfinder to show where your video is at a level you select, either 70, 80, 90, or 100% video. I like to set my zebra at 100% and make sure nothing in my frame exceeds 100%. This way, if my subject is a person, I set my iris where zebra occurs just on the highlights of my subject. If zebra fills the subject's face, I know I'm overexposed and I adjust. There are some instances where automatic functions are desirable, but most of the time you want to have total control over all of your camera's functions. Iris. Iris refers to how big or how small the aperture is that allows light into the camera. It sounds counterintuitive, but the higher the aperture number, the smaller the aperture. F16 means the aperture is small, and F1.7 means the aperture is large. The brighter the scene, the smaller the aperture to limit the amount of light coming in. We'll go over this in more detail in a later segment in the series. But for now, you need to know that you should adjust your aperture manually whenever possible. Why not just leave it on auto iris? Well, there are a couple of reasons. If you select the auto iris and something brighter than your subject passes in front of your subject, your camera will iris down and then iris up again. And that's the mark of an amateur. 
Also, if you're shooting a subject on a stage who is illuminated by a spotlight, your camera will probably overexpose. A professional will keep his or her iris on manual and expose for 100% video on the highlights. Remember, you can color correct for video that is slightly underexposed, but video that is overexposed is technically beyond saving. A good time to put your iris on auto is when you're shooting outdoors on a sunny day and there are a lot of clouds passing by the sun. To try to follow the changes in light intensity manually is impossible and it is better to let the camera do it automatically. Neutral density filters. Your camera should have built-in neutral density filters. What do these do? They block different amounts of light entering the camera without changing color temperature, depending on which filter is used. Why is this important? Remember, we talked about proper exposure being a function of f-stop and shutter speed. If you're shooting in bright sunlight, what if you can't get your iris small enough to get a proper exposure? Then your shutter speed will need to be increased because the higher the shutter speed, the more light is necessary. We've probably all seen videos shot on smartphones out in the bright sun where the movement seems all jittery. There's no natural fluidity to the movement. That's because the camera has no neutral density filter and the shutter speed is so high to properly expose for the huge amount of light coming into the camera. If you can cut a half or three quarters of the light coming into the camera, you can have a slower shutter speed that looks more natural. Well, that's when neutral density filters come in handy. A good rule of thumb is to shoot at an f5.6 iris at 1 60th or 1 100th frames per second shutter speed. If you are at f16 and still look overexposed, it's time to dial in a neutral density filter to get back down to an f5.6. Shutter speed. For most of your shooting, 1 60th of a second is an appropriate shutter speed and lends a natural fluid look to your video. It's good to be able to manually dial in a higher shutter speed if you're shooting sports and want less blur or as we'll cover in a later segment if you need to open your iris to decrease depth of field. I know don't get freaked out yet. We'll talk about all this in a later video but for now trust me you want to be able to change your shutter speed. White balance. Make sure your camera is capable of manually adjusting white balance. A quick tutorial on white balance. Color temperature is measured in degrees Kelvin, and it changes depending on what the source of light is. Sunlight outdoors is about 5,500 degrees and is referred to as cool because it looks bluish. In the shade, it's 6,500 degrees or higher. Indoor light illuminated by halogen or tungsten light is about 3200 degrees Kelvin and is referred to as warm because it's orangish. Our human brains can adjust to the differences in color temperature organically and make anything white as white and then all the other colors fall into place. Cameras on the other hand must be told what is white under different lighting conditions. Once the camera knows what is white all the other colors will be correct. Of course most if not all cameras have automatic white balance and act somewhat like our brains. And this can be useful if you're shooting news and going from one source of light to the next, all the while recording, like say you're following action from outdoors to indoors on the same shot. However, if you have control over your environment, it is best to white balance under the lighting source. It is more accurate and your colors won't shift if the lighting in your scene momentarily changes. I'll use the example of shooting on a sunny day with clouds passing by the sun again. As your subject goes from sunlit to shady and back, your colors will slightly shift if your camera is on auto white balance. Focus. It is best to keep your camera set to manual focus and focus accordingly. This will serve you well for 99% of your work. The only time I have ever used autofocus is during fashion shows where the models are walking towards the camera. It's difficult to follow focus manually while the subject continues towards you, especially if you're also tilting and zooming at the same time. So autofocus is preferable in this specific case. 
In just about all other instances, autofocus has the potential to really mess you up. Let's say that you are following your subject while your lens is set to autofocus. If any object passes between you and your subject, the lens will autofocus on that object and after it passes, we'll attempt to focus again on your subject. It looks like a mess and again instantly brands you as an amateur. And with manual focus, you can create artistic shots using objects in the foreground and background, having one in focus and the other out of focus. Then you manually focus to change the sharpness of the two objects. This is called a rack focus. On the subject of focus, your camera should have a focus enhance function, which will make it easier to get perfect focus. Obviously, in HD video, focus is extremely important. Sometimes something that looks in focus in your viewfinder will actually look soft on a large television monitor. This is why you should always use a focus enhance function if you have one. On some cameras, a thin red or green line will appear in your viewfinder around the subject when it is in perfect focus. Broadcast cameras have a feature called peaking, which do the same thing. Peaking will make your subject have hard edges in the viewfinder when the subject is in perfect focus. Zoom. Your zoom lens should have a servo zoom rocker that allows you to zoom in and out at a variable rate. In a later video in the series, I will show you how to creep the zoom extra slow. It's all technique. Sometimes you need to slap the zoom in and out, either to quickly get a sharp focus, or if you're doing it for an artistic effect. If it's in a, for an artistic effect, it's called a slap zoom. For this, you need to be able to disengage the zoom servo. So get a camera that allows you to override the servo zoom so you can zoom manually. SDI HDMI out. This is either a video BNC or HDMI connection. One reason you want this is to be able to see your image on an external monitor. Another big reason is that this is an uncompressed video signal before it goes through the codec and gets compressed. You can record this uncompressed video signal to a less compressed or even an uncompressed format on an external device than what your camera records. For example, if you have an HDV camera with an SDI output, you can record the pristine uncompressed signal to a device that records the video to uncompressed or a less compressed codec. Format. Your camera should be able to record in various formats and frame rates. I won't go into too much detail at this point. Most broadcast television is shot in 1080i, which means 1920 by 1080 interlaced. Other popular formats include 1080 30p and 1080 24p, which is progressive instead of interlaced. If you're shooting for the web, 30p is a good format. It's a good idea to have a camera that records in different formats and ask your client what format that they want to shoot. 